appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in this meeting. Uh, as Eric mentioned, I'm going to talk a little about melon herbicides. There's probably 30 or 40 uh, grass and broadleaf herbicides that are uh, common in this region, and every one of them can be a problem in melons. Uh, with the fall and spring melons, the long season that we grow them under, um, they can all at times be a problem. And we're dependent not just on herbicides, but on cultivation and hand labor as well to, to control them all. Um, this slide shows uh, development of uh, herbicides for the various crops grown in this region over the uh, last 50 years. And you can see that uh, melons, uh, there's very little been developed in recent years from melons. <coughs> Uh, there's only one crop, leaf lettuce, that there's fewer herbicides available for. This is the year that most of them were developed, and with the exception of Halosulfuron or Sandia and Select, just about all of them are 25 to 30 years old. So most of our efforts have been not in uh, developing new chemistry, but to figure out ways to make the old products work better. This slide shows um, the weed, weed control uh, that we've rated over the last several years with the herbicides that are available currently for melons in this region. It looks like from this slide like there's more available than there really is. Um, the uh, Cethoxidem or Post and Clethodem or uh, Select, Arrow, Select Max, um, those are just grass herbicides. They're very effective, but if we're dealing with uh, one of the several broadleaf weeds we have, um, you have to take those out. Uh, then we're, we have Ethafluralin or Curvet, used to be called Sonalan. We've never been able to use that, that safely in this region. We've seen a, a lot of injury from that product over the years. Anytime it gets anywhere near the seed, we get injury. So we haven't been able to use that safely. So this is what we end up with. Really only four products um, uh, for melons in this region that control all the weeds that we get. I want to just take the next few minutes to talk about how we uh, might use these most effectively. Uh, I'm going to start with Daxol. It's not a new product, as you all know. It's been around for more than 50 years. It was first developed in 1958 by uh, Fermenta, belonged to uh, ISK Biotech for several years until 1997 when manufacturing was briefly halted and uh, um, AMBAC acquired it in 2000. The only major change in it has been the change in formulation from the, uh, the uh, uh, wettable powder uh, to a flowable. They're both still available and both still used. Uh, the key with Daxol is it's a pre-emergence herbicide and it's absorbed by both the roots and the shoots, but most of the absorption uh, is the shoots, not so much the roots. The hypocotyl on broadleaf weeds that where the shoots coming out of seed and the coleoptal on the grass. It's important that we have the herbicide right there when the weed germinates. And uh, contrary to what most many people think, oftentimes you will get emergence of this uh, of weeds with this with this with Dactol. Um, it, they'll start to come out. They'll absorb the start to emerge from the soil, absorb the herbicide, and then slowly die. So when you, if you do see some weeds emerge, it doesn't mean that you're not going to control them. Um, a key to this and many other soil applied herbicides is how strongly it adheres to the soil. It is a key to how we can use them most effectively. You can see next to Balan and Trapland, two dinitroanolins that are held very tightly to the soil. Dactol is, is next. Very tightly held to the soil as compared to something like Eptan. Uh, this, is a, this is a coefficient of uh, absorption, they call it. It's just a measure they put the herbicide in the, in the solution and they just measure what comes out the, the bottom. Um, it, putting a, so it takes a lot of water to incorporate Daxol. Um, not only does it help it, uh, incorporate the herbicide into the soil, um, but it also helps uh, compete for binding sites on the soil with the, with the uh, 
um, herbicide. You want some of the herbicide in solution, you don't want it all bound tightly to the soil. Um, so they, uh, you don't want a herbicide that's, that's very mobile or you'll leach it, but you want one that they had some in solution. If you put uh, Gactyl on very hot, uh, dry soil, oftentimes it'll bind to that soil and, and it won't be available for leak control. Um, having said that, um, we uh, uh, incorporate Dactyl both with sprinklers and with furrow irrigation. Sometimes it's chemigated and can be used effectively both ways. Um, this was a field up in Blythe a few years ago where the same rate of Dactyl was put on at the same time. The field on the left, it was incorporated with furrow irrigation and the beds were blackened and, and, there was, and the moisture was held there. There was good so moisture on top of the bed. There was a band put in both cases uh, right down the middle of the bed. Uh, you can see how much better it worked um, where it was furrow uh, incorporated as opposed to sprinkler incorporated. In this case, we, we know that light frequent irrigations with uh, sprinklers doesn't incorporate backfill very well. We've always told people the more water you can put on it, the better it's going to work. In this case, it's just the opposite. We think that uh, they put on too much water and leached the herbicide below the germinating weeds. My gut feeling is, and, and, and just when you think you have these things figured out, something like this happens, because I've always told people put on as much water as you can. Um, my gut feeling is that when you, when you spray a band on it, incorporate it with furrow irrigation, that you get a little more uniform uh, and consistent results than you do with sprinklers where, you, where you, it's a little more dicey putting on too much or too little water. But it can work effectively both ways. Um, it can't, this is, you can't see, this isn't a very good slide, but if you can see better, you can see this was Dactyl put on uh, down below here. This was prior to uh, transplanting. And uh, it stunted, it worked very well, but it, it stunted the melons. You cannot use Dactyl or Treplan prior to the, the plant being well established, uh, or you'll get uh, unacceptable stunting of the plant. So you can only use Dactyl and Treplan um, as a uh, um, lay-by treatment on uh, established melons. Uh, let me move to Prefar. Another old product is Finner. was registered first in the 60s. Um, first by Stauffer, then ICI or Zeneca had it for a while, and, and, and Gowan has had it since about the mid-1990s. Uh, um, I've had several trials with Prefar, and I've had anywhere, in this case, from 100% control to zero control. This isn't magic, there's got to be a reason for it, and we're constantly looking for reasons for why the, this occurs, and with Prefar, every year we see anywhere from zero to 100% control. In, in this case, let me back up, this is ground cherry, and Prefar, if you were going to grow John, ground cherry, you could use or, uh, Prefar, you could use Prefar as a herbicide on ground cherry, it just does, has no activity on it. Prefar is active on four or five broadleaf weeds and, uh, and several grasses, but that's about it. It's not very broad spectrum. Um, unlike uh, um, Dactyl, Prefar uh, can be uh, incorporated very well with sprinklers, but not at all with furrow irrigation. If you're going to spray uh, Dact or Prefar on the bag top and try and incorporate it with furrow irrigation, it's just not going to work. Um, uh, it all adheres very strongly to the soil, um, but it takes a lot of water to incorporate, to move it off the soil surface down to where the weeds are germinating. This is a trial we did several years ago where we applied different amounts of water over the top of um, Prefar, and you can see it worked better. The more water we put on it, the better. So the key to using Dactyl is putting it on uh, uh, Pre-emergence and incorporating it with overhead sprinklers and putting a lot of water on.
Um, this is a herbicide that I started to work with in the mid-1900s. It's called Sandia now. At that time, it was Mon 12,000. It was developed by Monsanto. And we always thought of it and still do think of it mainly as a nutsedge herbicide. The active ingredient is halosulfuron. This is one of my first trials with it on grain sorghum, and it worked very well. You can see on purple nutsedge. It's now registered on several crops. It belongs to Gowan Company now. Um, it's called Sandia and Melons. It's also called Permit on um, grain sorghum and corn. Yukon is a, is a premix with uh, dicamber or banville. And for turf control, it's called Sedgeham. Um, in addition to nutsedge, it has very good activity on broadleaf weeds, and it's now registered in melons, which tolerates uh, Sandia fairly well. This is a trial we had. We had 10 different melon varieties and uh, um, you can see our plot sprayed across the melon varieties. This was a uh, common purslane. Uh, it was applied pre-emergence and incorporated with sprinklers and you can see how very active this herbicide is. It was very good on uh, purslane. You can see if you, if you can't see it real well here because of the weeds, but it also stunted the melons. And melons um, uh, can tolerate it fairly well. Post emergence, once the crop is established, pre emergence, you get quite a bit of stunting. Uh, it's a very difficult herbicide to understand. It's only good pre emergence on some weeds like purslane. It won't control personally in post-emergence. Only good post-emergence on weeds like nutsedge and some weeds both. But it's a tough herbicide to really get a good understanding of. Um, this is a field where we applied it over the top of uh, uh, some melons and, and, and that's pigweed. It stunted it in almost all cases, even with nutsedge. Sandia takes more than one application. I have some nutsedge in my yard. I've been spraying for seven years with Sandia. It just takes a constant, it takes two or three applications a year for I don't know how many years. But it, it's not, you get such good initial knockdown that you think it's, it, it's doing a better job than it is over the long haul. Um, I want to finish up with some non-chemical techniques. Uh, this is plastic. Plastic works very well on, on uh, for melons on wide beds with strip uh, irrigation. You can see on the left there, no plastic as opposed to plastic in this case with watermelons. If there's moisture in the furrows, you get walk, you get uh, can get weeds in the furrow. People have sometimes seen uh, sprayed Roundup in the between the middles, and uh, some people have reported that if some of it gets on the plastic, the melons can pick it up on the vine spread. In this case, this is kind of a novel approach. I, I've never worked with this, but it, it may be an idea to try. It's kind of like a chemical mud flap. It's it's like a um, it's a, uh, like an old wick for melons, but it drags it right down between those furrows. I wanted to finish up with this. Um, a few years ago, uh, people come, started to say they thought they were seeing problems with Sandy or uh, um, Select or Select Max on melons. And uh, we've never seen activity on broad leaves with any of those grass herbicides. In this case, we put out a trial. We didn't expect to see anything, but we did. And I just wanted to mention, this, this is a 2x rate. This was Select Max. It was just the Select Max. It was something in that formulation that causes injury to melons where you get a 2x rate, where you get overlapping and slow down at the ends of the field. And that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. If anybody has any questions, um, I think I've already told you everything I know. <laughs> Thank you very much.